Crown Produce supplying select Canadian retailers. Crown Produce, proud sponsors of Canada West Football and Canadian University Countdown on Shaw. Welcome to another edition of Crown Canadian University Countdown. I'm Jim Mullen. Well, it was a blowout bowl weekend in the CIS this past weekend. And to tell you about it, Orville Redenbacher and Colonel Sanders. You know we just called you Orville Redenbacher, right? Yeah, that would make you Colonel Sanders. Of course, with this stash, I'm finger licking good. Apologize to the viewers. Original recipe? Extra crispy. Apologize to the viewers. Over the years, we have witnessed some mighty clashes between some dominating forces. Ali versus Frazier. Godzilla versus King Kong. Freddy versus Jason. Uh, could this clash of the Titans, the two top teams in the CIS, McMaster, Calgary, live up to the hype the same way Mayweather versus Pacquiao did? Uh, dude, that fight never happened. You know, Mayweather never gets a fair shake. No. Money, money, Mayweather never really does. Never get I guess Damn that Larry Merchant. With, with a name like that, though. Yeah, Ron Joy Stadium, Hamilton, Ontario, home of the mighty Marauders, also the home of that man, Kyle Quinlan, who's going head to head with fellow Heck Creighton nominee Eric Daleski. Blake Neal and his dinos looking to dethrone Steph Potasic and his reigning champion Marauders first cue. And here's something you don't see very often. Quinlan on the run, takes a hit, goes airborne, pigskin pops loose. Dinos recover, but they do nothing with the turnover. Later in the queue, Dinos up three blank. Quinlan with loads of time, looks downfield, connects with Dallin Brooks. That's 39 yards. Discipline starts to get to Calgary. On third and inches, Quinlan goes for the QB sneak. Take a look to the right of your screen as Jordan Verdoni tries to literally rip Quinlan's head off. That's a 15 yard penalty, which puts Mac close to the Dinos red zone. So, very next play, Quinlan to Brad Foshisato, who finds a little room and brings it inside the Calgary 10-yard line, which leads to this one-yard plunge from Mr. Quinlan. Mack takes its first lead, and a bloody Quinlan hits the sideline, looking no worse for wear. Midway through the second, and the Mack D starts to come to life. Ben Dagular shows why he's a Metris Award nominee, sacking Delaski for a loss of six. Then, Nick Shorthill gets the Dinos pivot back-to-back -back sacks for Mack, forcing the Dinos to punt that ball. Very next series, Quinlan back to Brooks. That's a gain of 21. Marauders back in the red zone. Quinlan on the move, dodges a couple of would-be tackles, goes to the outside where Verdoni makes another bonehead mistake. Laundry hits the field, hits Quinlan late. So Quinlan punches in his second major of the day, makes him pay. Mack extends the lead to 13. Right before the beer break, Quinlan puts the game out of reach. Goes deep for Brad Foshisato, who flies past his defender. That's a 61-yard major. Matt takes a 20-point lead into the break. Move to the third, and if the game wasn't already over, this would put it to bed. Quinlan to Robert Babick for the major. That put the Marauders up by 34. Mack takes its 22nd straight game, smacking those dinos while en route to yet another Vanier Cup. The Marauders put up 486 yards of total offense. Quinlan throws 412 of those yards, completing 25 of 35 for three touchdowns. He also ran in three. Robert Babbitt and Brad Fochisato both collecting over 100 yards in the air and one touchdown. Eric Dulaski was pulled midway through the third queue for rookie Andrew Buckley. Calgary, the nation's most dominating offensive team, scores just six points while managing just 200 yards of total offense. Not the best. Sorry, Andrew Buckholz, your team is out but your mustache is still very much in. When it comes to cliches in sports broadcasting, the use of David versus Goliath gets used over and over and over and over again. In the case of Acadia and Laval, comparing Acadia to David would be, well, selling the real David short. The tailgating started early for this one. The hometown crowd looking for yet another berth for its Rouge or in the Vanier Cup. 
just over 10,000 on hand for this one, including this pirate and former WWF wrestling star, the ultimate warrior, Quebec City. Well, it really brings out those celebs. Pick this one up in the second queue. Laval up three zip. Tristan Grenon goes to the air for Yannick Moore and Plant, who makes an unreal grab, looking like a modern day Willie Mays. That leads to this easy scamper for Christian Normand. Laval now up by 10. Dying minutes of the queue. Grenon gets his squad moving. He finds Matthew Norzeal. That's 18. Then he hands it off to Max Boutin, who got the start for the injured Pascal Lachard. Picks up another 14. First and goal, Laval. Very next play. Grenon goes back to Boutin. Put another seven on the board. Boutin gives his best Yermir Jaeger salute. Much to the delight of this guy with the red stripe down his face. My guess, he had a couple of red stripes before this one. Laval takes an 18 0 lead into the half. Third cue, and more of the same for the Red Machine. Grenon to Norzil, who makes the Axeman D look like Swiss cheese. Not one white jersey can get their mitts on him. That's a 63 yard major. Check out the celebration. Looking like Jim Mullen doing his morning aerobics routine. Get those knees up! However, the Axemen would respond. Graves on play action, fakes out the entire Rouge Or defense, finds Andrew Healy, and the man with the godlike first name. Well, he's off to the races. That's a 73 yard major. Is Acadia starting to mount a comeback? Yeah, not so fast. Very next series for Laval. Grandon tosses the dagger, pumps a few times, and then airs it out to Julian Bailey in the end zone. Bailey's celebration, reminiscent of Ryan on a Friday night at the Roxy. Laval crushes Acadia 42 to seven, taking the UTEC Bowl and earning a berth in the Vanier Cup for a third consecutive year. Maxim Boutin fills in for Pascal Lachard, rushing for 213 yards. Matthew Norzeal gathered 148 yards and one touchdown. Keep in mind, both of those young kids are just in their second year of eligibility. The Rouge Or put up an incredible 586 yards of total offense on the day. So we're finally there, ladies and gentlemen. We've reached the mountaintop, also known as the Vanier Cup, a rematch between two teams that played quite possibly the greatest game of football ever played in the history of the world at last season's final at BC Place here in Vancouver. The Rogers Centre in TDOT, as the kids say, is where this year's final will be. Ken Laval snap the Mac 22 game win streak. Will the Marauders win back-to-back -back Vanier Cups? Will I ever find true love? Probably not, but we'll all find out about the rest of that this weekend. Not the true love? Maybe. Not yet. It's not my time. You haven't been to Roxy. <laughs> oh, yeah. So what do you think? The Vanier going to live up to the hype? Does every colonel pop? What the hell are you talking about? I don't know. This guy knows Mr. Jim Mullen. With butter on it, Roundtable looks forward to the upcoming Vanier Cup. Coming up next. Crown Produce supplying select Canadian retailers. Crown Produce, proud sponsors of Canada West Football and Canadian University Countdown on Shaw.
Hey, welcome back to Crown Canadian University Countdown. I'm Ryan Sullivan. It's time for the round table portion. We are joined by Mr. Jim Mullen. We have the pistols again. Oh, All right. yeah, always. I wonder if we're going to go show Just without the pistols. Just it wouldn't be you. the same if we didn't have them, right? <laughs> so keep it going. I like it. I like it. Uh, of course, Billy Green, the uh, UBC T-Bird quarterback, and J.P. Schwarray from Acrofoot.com over in the Quebec Qua. Now, start things out with uh, RSAQ, uh, RSEQ. Versus uh, AUS. That French. That, yeah. was, that was pretty good. Yeah. What do you think, JP? That sounded kind of French, didn't it? <laughs> you're, getting, you're getting better every week. <laughs> <laughs> it's the mustache. I'm not used to talking with it, right? Uh, okay, so we'll start things out here. Laval 42, Acadia 7. JP, let's break it down. Well, you know what? This was a, a, an expected result, but really was a flawless performance from Laval. Uh, aside from that one big play of Acadia that you know nearly gathered over 70 yards, uh, on a single play and their lone touchdown, Laval all the way, their defense showed up, their offense showed up. Let's put it this way. Uh, offensively, their top two running backs were out of the game, but they still ran for over 300 yards thanks to Max Boutin, second-year player who racked up 200 yards in his first start. So really a great job by Laval. And once again, it all starts with that O-line just eating up uh, Acadia's defense yet again in the UTEC. How do you think uh, Acadia's defense stacks up uh, against some of those uh, other defenses, say in the RSEQ? Because I think if there was anything that we saw during that bowl game was that Acadia's defense was just simply left out on the field too long. I thought they looked okay through about a quarter and a third, and then they were just worn down, JP. Oh, yeah, I have to agree with you. After one quarter, the score was only 3-0 for Laval, and that Acadia defense looked solid. They were able to apply, play, apply pressure on the quarterback. You know, the DBs were looking good. But like you said, you know, Acadia's offense just didn't show up, and that defense just wore down thanks to the Laval running game. But really, that defense looked good. Uh, you know, maybe not in the same category as the Montreal's and the Laval, but, uh, but really it was right up there in the top 10 defenses in the country, no doubt. JP, let's touch on the health of Laval. They got uh, dinged up a bit here and there down the stretch. Uh, heading into the Vanier Cup, how are they looking? Well, you know what? A couple of key players were out for the UTEC. Uh, Guillaume Riou, a captain, a slot back, punt returner, should be dressed for the Vanier Cup. As for the running backs, Pascal Lachard, their leading rusher, is out of the ball game. That is, uh, he got probably a high ankle sprain, so he's out of Vanier. And Guillaume Bourassa, the other running back, uh, game time decision. He's been uh, uh, carrying an injury to his, uh, you know, uh, to his leg for all season. So who knows? But uh, right now, you know, for them, you know, Arnaud Gascon, I know, is full health, and uh, the other O lines uh, look good as well. So uh, not so much an issue right now in Laval. Now, uh, you know, the the good news about um, you know, of course, uh, kind of a rematch of last year is that it's in Toronto. This is going to up the numbers huge. It's basically going to be a home game for McMaster, more or less, but there's going to be a lot of people there representing the RSEQ. Oh, definitely. I mean, those Laval fans are, are so pumped for this game. I've been, you know, talking to a, a bunch of fans in the tailgate for weeks, and they're just, you know, they already bought their tickets. They're going for that one. And uh, like you said, you know, all, all the hype, uh, surrounding that rematch with last year's finish. Everybody's pumped, and uh, we should expect, you know, a lot of player, uh, fans coming from Laval, but uh, like you said, McMaster still has the edge as the home field. See, now that was, that was kind of what I was thinking. When it comes to momentum sort of thing, uh, you know, you beat Calgary, McMaster beats Calgary. I mean, that's a pretty big feat. Calgary has been ranked up there on the big board every single week, and they stomped him. But Laval, I mean, you take out uh, Acadia, it's not really the biggest accomplishment. No offense, Acadia, by the way. But uh, not the greatest accomplishment. Your thoughts on that? Uh, you're right. You know, I mean, they had beat them earlier this season uh, by a lower score. But really, Laval has just been uh, gaining that momentum these, uh, these past weeks. Offensively, they look as good as ever. Defensively as well. And, uh, but for them, it's, it's, it's that playing, you know, not on their home turf. So that's going to be a big issue for them because they've been solid in these playoffs. But it's at home in front of their 15,000 fans. So they won't have that much of an edge. Uh, uh, with the, the field, uh, the field advantage in the back. Mitchell Bull. I want to talk about Mitchell Bull before we run out of time here, because this guy made a prediction going into the Hardy Cup about a certain team lacking discipline, and that would be the Calgary Dinos. Yeah, Calgary all year. Uh, that was something that I really noticed with this team this year, rather than years past that I played them. They were, uh, they lacked a lot of discipline. It was in previous years they'd take a couple 
holding penalties, a couple pass interference penalties, but this year it was personal foul after personal foul, and I think it really hurt them this week because you can't give Kyle Quinlan a short field to so many times he's going to end up hurting you. So uh, that's something that they're going to have to fix going forward. And I think that uh, Blake Nill is going to address that in the offseason. I think he's going to start uh, taking guys off the field if they continue to do that. And, and I know Jordan Verdoni is a drafted player in the Canadian Football League, and I know he plays an intense game. But it, it, he committed some very silly, selfish fouls out on that field, uh, especially in the first half, which really set the tone and also uh, place the McMaster Marauders into places where they could uh, continue drives and put them in the scoring position. There were some silly penalties taken out there. I don't think the Laval Rouge et Or are going to be nearly that undisciplined. There's been some chatter uh, kind of the last few weeks anyhow about uh, the AUS uh, and Canada West kind of falling back. You know, I mean, obviously they're not... Uh, in the realm at the moment of the Lavals and the, uh, you know, and the, uh, excuse me, the McMasters kind of representing the OUA and stuff like that. Kind of your thoughts on these two conferences and kind of how far behind they are when it comes to progression. Oh, well, uh, and, and, you know, I'm excited to, to hear about uh, Jim and uh, Jim's thought on the, on the Can West situation, but really the AUS, we've been expecting this kind of fallback uh, since the season started. Uh, so I thought it was like a three division uh, CIS uh, country right now, you know, the, the, the OUA being the top conference, the RSCQ and Can West, I had them uh, at a level playing field. But right now, you know, with Calgary's performance, and I throw in that back up to you guys, but uh, it looks like Can West is taking a uh, falling back as well. Well, one of the things that I was very surprised about was going to the Canadian Bowl on the same day the Hardy Cup was going on. The Canadian Bowl, of course. Uh, the junior championship and the junior teams that I've seen in the past have been way more physical, a lot larger, a lot more imposing than what I saw of the two best teams in the country between Saskatoon uh, and the Langley Rams. And I think this 5-7 rule, it's hurt the AUS, but in addition to that, it's uh, certainly hurt the Canada West, but it's also hurt the supply chain. Uh, Bill, I think you have a lot of players right now that are looking to kind of get into their junior career for about two years and get out and I think that's really kind of cut the herd in half hasn't it? Yeah it definitely has a lot of guys on my team uh, other guys in the Canada West they uh, they probably go and play either a year or two you don't see a lot of guys playing three four and five years in junior now because they want to get in they want to play right away in the CIS that's guys goals now a lot of guys now with school being more important to get a job they understand they have to go to university if they're not going to do trade so I think that factors into it as well. So guys want to get in right away to CIS programs. They want to play. They want to contribute. They kind of don't want to delay it. Uh, we had, I think, probably six or seven guys on our team this year who played, I think, one or two years of junior. And in previous years, we've had guys with five years of junior experience come over to us. So I think times are changing. Well, I think the downside of it all, too, is that you don't want situations like the uh, old Manitoba Bisons team where guys are actually... Uh, older than professional players. That Manitoba team that won in 2007 was, uh, uh, by some estimates, even older than the Winnipeg Blue Bombers who were playing two days later in the Grey Cup. Uh, I know some people in Western Canada, JP, think that uh, the CGEP rule of, uh, of the uh, three and five is a little unfair, but uh, for those people who don't understand outside of Quebec, explain the CGEP system to, uh, to folks. Oh, well, yeah, you know, so there's the, the five years of high school and then you have uh, either two or three years in CJEB before going to university. But that rule has changed uh, as recently as two years ago. And that's why there's been some issues with elig eligibility in the RCQ this year. It's that those three plus five, so it's eight total years of CJEB and university. It's not, uh, you know, if you take a year off, you lose a year. So it's eight years from the moment you finish high school. So so moving on, you know, players won't be able to play in their late 20s. When, when they're going to reach a certain plateau, let's say at 24, 25, that's going to be it for them. Yeah, very interesting. And then, uh, of course, to our viewers at home, we're writing this down, keeping notes, of course. Uh, hopefully they, they, they got that because it, it is an interesting rule. And like kind of moving forward in the next uh, few years and whatnot, uh, this rule, the eligibility thing, has kind of caught a lot of teams, not a lot of teams, a few teams off guard here and there. A few have been caught by this. Is there a way to kind of make things a little more, uh, for lack of better terms, user-friendly sort of thing and uh, kind of give the eligibility more of a cushion sort of thing? Or is it going to be a strict rule that's going to hurt a lot of teams moving forward, you think? Uh, it, it should get better. And I had uh, 
a long chat with John Bauer of the RSEQ uh, with that specific matter in the, as a discussion. And really, you know, they're taking this matter really seriously and they want to simplify things moving on. So we should get expect things to get better uh, as, uh, you know, as soon as uh, next year. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? We, we should probably touch on, on the Vanny. We've touched on the two uh, big games this past weekend. But going forward here, I mean, it, there's no question the two best teams are in that game from this CIS season. How is it going to unfold? I mean, you mentioned that it's going up against, you know, one of the greatest games of all time, arguably, I suppose. You might as well throw in there. But uh, one of the greatest games. I mean, I watched it. It was fantastic. Uh, your thoughts kind of heading into this game. Both teams do have a uh, pretty good uh, a bit of momentum built up, as we mentioned with JP earlier. Kind of your thoughts on the Vanny. I'm looking forward to a pretty entertaining Vanier Cup, maybe not as much uh, in the entertaining category as we saw last year because, as we know, they've been billing that game as the greatest game ever. Uh, but uh, this should be pretty interesting as, uh, as we approach this national championship. Uh, paired up with the 100th Grey Cup with basically a sellout crowd in the two lower bowls. I don't know what JP thinks about this, but I actually think the McMaster Marauders took the Laval Rouge Or by surprise to one degree or another in that first half. That's how they were able to build that huge lead. Uh, I, I think McMaster held back a few secrets last week in uh, the Mitchell Bowl. Uh, uh, some surprises with the way they moved their linebackers around. Calgary didn't have an answer for it. I'm wondering if on both sides, each of them have a surprise or two that they're saving for this, uh, for this uh, Vanier Cup. JP, do you think that um, the Laval Rouge or, or that conventional of a team that they feel like they don't have to put wrinkles into an offense or defense, do you think that uh, they are a team that think that they don't need surprises, that it's all about execution? Well, you know what? That's a very well-coached team that you have at Laval. And one thing's for sure is they, is they fuel off execution. You know, that's, that's the key to everything. But they will throw a wrinkle or two in there. You know, they had a fake punt uh, two weeks ago. This week, you know, early in the ball game, uh, you know, a little out and up. They set up some, some plays to, to get some big plays as well and some screen passes. So, so they will have something uh, to set up McMaster, that's for sure. Billy, when you look at a front seven like uh, McMaster's and you look at a front seven like Lavelle's, uh, uh, where, where are the challenges from a quarterback's perspective uh, facing those fronts? I think it's the speed in the linebacking cores. Uh, Plessius for Laval is one of the best linebackers in the country, maybe one of the best CF CIS linebackers ever. He, uh, he's big, he's physical, he runs fast, so uh, quarterbacks have to be on their game knowing where guys of his caliber are all the time so Quinlan last year lost him once he threw a pick six to Plessius that kind of changed the game for them uh, for Kyle he's gonna have to know where he is on every play uh, if they're wanting to execute uh, Laval is gonna execute their game plan to perfection that's kind of what I've noticed uh, from them over the years they're perfectionists they want to go out there execute their game plan uh, McMaster's probably the best prepared team they'll definitely have some wrinkles for the Val uh, Rouge R, so it's uh, setting up to be a very exciting game. You're, you're a running quarterback, uh, especially in the offense that you had set up for you uh, this past year. Uh, you take a look at McMaster's successes over the last two games, really the running game has come from Kyle Quinlan. Do you think he can get away with being the prime running back as a quarterback against the Laval defense? I think it's going to be tough. Uh, last year he showed uh, in the Vanier Cup that he can run against this team, so I think he's going to try. I think this year Laval is going to be better prepared for him to run. I think last year that's one of the things that I noticed in the game uh, was that they kind of uh, maybe didn't pay enough attention to him. Uh, this year without a uh, top running back, I think that they're going to really focus in on him. They're going to have a lot of game plans to shut him down. JP, same question. It's going to be hard to run against that uh, defensive front from a quarterback position. And the best way to have success doing so is by throwing early and throwing with success. So you can expect Kyle Quinlan to you know, complete some early passes before taking off. All right, here we go. Now we've set it up. We've given previews. Let's give some assumptions. Let's give some predictions. Here we go. We'll start at the end of the table, Mr. Well, Jim. Why Lowell. do you look at me first? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know what? We'll come down to this end of the table. You know, we'll, we'll, play, we'll pay some more long distance here. Go. Unbelievable. Uh, JP, what do we got? Prediction, my friend. 
you know what, we're going to have a great football game. It's the rematch everyone's been expecting for. And, and really, you know, I like Laval. They're going to be prepared. But McMaster is the team to beat. And I believe McMaster will win their second Vanny Cup in a row. I expect Cal Quinlan to throw yet another fantastic performance, get MVP, get the heck right in. And listen to this. I want him to be a CFL quarterback next season. So I'm rooting for both teams for a good game, but I want Mac to win for Kyle. There you go. Uh, I agree. I uh, think Laval is going to come out. They're not going to fall behind like they did last year. I think it's going to be another game down to the wire, but I'm taking Kyle Quinlan at the end. I want him to have the ball if I'm a coach. Uh, game's in his hands, tie game, down six, down however many. Uh, I trust that he's going to get the job done, and they're going to come probably maybe a four-point victory for McMaster. Nice, nice. By the way, here's another guy that I want to see as a quarterback in the <laughs> CFL, but uh, I'll just keep my fingers crossed on that. Uh, I made a prediction at the start of the year in the CIS blog, and I'm going to have to stick with it, even though I agree with uh, the potential for Kyle Quinlan's dominance. Uh, you know, maybe because they don't have a running game, that's a way to shy away from Laval a little bit. I predicted uh, before game one was played that Laval would, and I even called a score, uh, that Laval would beat McMaster 26-22, so I have to stick with that. Very nice, very nice. I think I'm going to go with uh, McMaster as well with the maroon bow tie. Uh, they've looked just unbelievable all season. Uh, you can't argue with the greatness of Kyle Quinn. And the guy is just unreal. It's men against boys when he's on the field. Uh, you got to go with McMaster. So pretty unanimous there, I would say. Uh, okay, we're going to wrap things up from uh, the Shaw Studio here in Vancouver, British Columbia. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you to our cast and crew, everyone on the table. Uh, before I forget, JP, quick Twitter plug. Yeah, guys, follow me at JP Schwalien on Acrofoot.com for extensive Vanny Cup coverage. Looking forward to see you there, Jim. There you go. Looking forward to reading those tweets. Uh, great job, as always. Uh, okay, so for Billy Green, UBC quarterback here in studio, Jim Mullen, Andrew Wadden, who's uh, not around anymore, but he did a great job a little earlier. Uh, thanks again from the Shaw Studio. Uh, you can find us a few different ways uh, through social media, facebook.com slash CIS on Shaw. You can find us on Twitter at CIS Countdown. And, of course, if you'd like to get behind the moustaches, donate.bccancerfoundation.com slash CIS show. Thanks again, and we will see you soon. Crown Produce supplying select Canadian retailers. Crown Produce. Proud sponsors of Canada West Football and Canadian University Countdown on Shaw.